Hello, I'm continuing and concluding my reviews on the Candyman series with 2021's Candyman. Now, this also concludes this year's Horror Month, which was supposed to end in October, but this year, obviously, as you can tell, it's extended out into November. Now, this was originally slated for a 2020 release, however, because of the pandemic, it got pushed back to this year, 2021. Now, this is the fourth film in the Candyman franchise, franchise acting as both a soft reboot of the series, as well as a direct sequel to the original Candyman from 1992, which was directed by Bernard Rose and based on the short story The Forbidden by Clive Barker. Now, apparently this film is ignoring the continuity of Candyman 2 and 3, however, the film does take some elements from those two movies, namely the second Candyman movie. For example, when you find out the backstory of the original original Candyman, they do use the name Daniel Robentai, and it wasn't until Candyman 2 where you found out that that was his real name. Now, even though I did use the name Daniel Robentai when talking about Candyman's backstory in my review of the first movie, I really only did that for simplicity's sake. The name Daniel Robentai is never actually used at all in the first film. It's not till the sequels where you find out that that was the character's real name. Which I do think is kind of funny. This movie is supposedly ignoring the events of the other two Candyman films, yet is still freely borrowing from them. But I can't complain about that too too much because the most recent Halloween movies do the exact same thing. Now, Candyman 2021 was co-written and directed by Nia Dacosca, who prior to this directed a movie called Little Woods, and she's going to be directing The Marvels, which is one of the upcoming Marvel Cinematic Universe movies. And the film is co-written and produced by Jordan Peele, who for the longest time was primarily known for his work in comedy. He was one of the co-creators of the sketch comedy series Key and Peel, but in recent years he's made a name for himself in the horror genre by directing films like Get Out and Us. He's also the showrunner for recent TV shows like Lovecraft Country and the latest incarnation of The Twilight Zone. Now, this was easily my most anticipated film of this year. When this film was first announced, I was extremely excited, especially when I heard that it was going to be a sequel and not a remake. Now, I saw this movie in the theaters back in August when it first came out, and while I liked it for the most part when I first saw it, I'll be lying if I said I wasn't a little disappointed. But since then, I've had time to digest the film a little bit more, and I just rewatched it in preparation for this review, and I can honestly say that this is a really good movie, and I think this is easily the best of the Candyman sequels, and it's the only sequel to actually do justice to the original film. But the film is also far from perfect, at least in my opinion. Now, what the plot of Candyman 2021 is it's about an artist named Anthony who moves with his girlfriend, who's a successful art dealer, to the newly gentrified Cabrini Green, and he hears the story of Helen Lyle, who people believe went crazy and tried to murder a baby boy, but was stopped and then committed suicide. Now, of course, if you've seen the original film, you would realize that's not exactly what happened. But in this movie, you learn that Helen's story has now become sort of an urban legend, and Anthony becomes fascinated with the story, and he starts looking into it, but he soon learns that what might have driven Helen crazy was her obsession with the legend of the Candyman, an evil ghost that haunts Cabrini Green. And Anthony, in turn, starts to become obsessed with the story of Candyman, and he starts incorporating it into his artwork, but but soon people he crosses paths with end up getting brutally murdered, and soon it becomes apparent that Candyman is not only real, but is starting to use Anthony as sort of a vessel, and Anthony is slowly transforming into a new incarnation of Candyman. Now, in the film, Anthony was played by... 
I'm gonna have a hell of a time pronouncing this actor's name, but I believe it's pronounced Yahya Abdul Mateen II. I can basically say his name, it just doesn't roll naturally off my tongue. But he does a great job in this movie, and the film really is a character study about this man descending into this rabbit hole and becoming lost in the myth of Candyman. And very much like with Helen in the first movie, he becomes so obsessed with the story of Candyman Man, that he's now become a part of the story, but as you learn later on in the film, he already was a part of Candyman's story. Now, this is a spoiler, but I already knew this going in, and if they were trying to keep this a secret, honestly, they did a really bad job, but it turns out that he's actually the baby that Candyman abducted and tried to kill in the first movie. And the reason he didn't realize this was because his mother was trying to keep it a secret from him, but honestly, I thought that was a brilliant way to tie this back to the first movie. And the film has elements of body horror, because in the film he gets stung by a bee, which we as the audience realize is one of Candyman's bees, and then the bee sting throughout the film starts spreading throughout his entire body like some kind of a disease. But if you look at it, there are burns that are forming on his body, and Candyman tried to kill him when he was a child by burning him to death. It's this whole idea that this was a destiny that Anthony was not meant to escape. He was meant to burn in that fire when he was a baby, and now that he's an adult, Candyman's going to make sure that he's not going to escape this destiny again. And Vanessa E. Williams reprises her role as Anne-Marie McCoy, Anthony's mother from the first movie. But unfortunately, she's not in the movie as much as I would have liked. Teona Paris, if I'm saying her name right, plays Brie, Anthony's girlfriend, who you find out in the movie has sort of a tragic past of her own, where you find out that her father committed suicide when she was a child, which really haunts her as an adult. Coleman Domingo, another great actor, plays the character of Billy Burke, who is an interesting character, and he is a very important character in the movie. My issue with him, though, is some of his characterization, especially towards the end of the film. Although there was a really cool Clive Barker reference with him in one scene where he's reading Weave World, which is one of my favorite Clive Barker novels. But again, he was an interesting character, but I was iffy with what they ended up doing with him towards the end of the film without getting into too many spoilers. And Michael Hargrove plays the character of Sherman Fields, who is... Technically, this is a spoiler, but some of the trailers do kind of give this away. Basically, Sherman Fields is our main incarnation of Candyman throughout the film. In the film, you find out that Candyman is not so much an individual being, rather it's the living embodiment of an idea, and in the film you realize that the spirits of different black men who were the victims of racial injustice have become the embodiments of this idea, and Daniel Robentai, who was the Candyman that we followed in the original film, was just one aspect of Candyman. Now, I know that might piss off some purists, but honestly, I do think that fits in thematically with the original film, because so much of the original film was about how urban legends and stories constantly evolve and mutate over time, and in this movie you realize that Candyman means different things to different people, just like stories and legends usually mean different things to different people. And my interpretation of the original film is that Candyman wasn't literally the ghost of Daniel Robin rather it was an entity that was brought to life by people's belief in it. So I think the idea that there are multiple candy men, or basically there are different aspects to this entity, I think it works. Now, Tony Todd does come back in this movie to reprise his role as the original Candyman. I'm not going to give it away, but people might be disappointed with how much screen time he actually has in the movie. Now, originally, the ghost of Helen Lyle, who was the main character of the first movie, was supposed to come back in this film, and you actually see a shot of her in the trailer, but unfortunately, all her scenes were cut. But the actress who is going to play the spirit of Helen, Cassie, 
Chelsea Kramer, I think is her name. She does have a brief cameo in the film as a librarian. Now, there is a scene where Anthony is listening to a voice recording that Helen made, and I think it actually is Virginia Matson's voice, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Now, the film has a lot of political and social commentary. It touches on themes of gentrification, this idea that they're going to come in and clean up a neighborhood, create better buildings, and make it a safer place to live, which in theory is not necessarily a bad thing. The issue is, by doing that, you're also driving out a lot of the lower-income families and people who just can't afford these nicer apartments. And it's this whole idea that they tore down the old Cabrini Green and built a new one, but they're also sort of forgetting the neighborhood's violent past, and not only that, they destroyed whatever community was originally there. The film also touches on themes of police corruption and police brutality and how it affects the black community, which of course is an issue that's been going on in this country for decades, but in recent years it's really come to light in the media. And a lot of people have complained that the film is too political. And I feel like some of the people saying that either A, have not actually seen the original Candyman, or completely missed the point of the original film. The original Candyman is a highly political movie. But you could argue that the original Candyman is not as on the nose about its political agenda as this movie is. And that is a criticism that I would have of this film is, it's not exactly subtle at all about its political message. Now, that's not inherently a bad thing, and sometimes not being subtle in your political message is how you get the message across, and sometimes can make the film more powerful. For example, my favorite movie of all time is the original Godzilla, and even if you only have a passing knowledge of world history, you should be able to tell that that film is a clear Hiroshima allegory. Or something like Alan Moore's Watchmen is an overtly political graphic novel, or John Carpenter's They Live, so lack of subtlety is not always a bad thing, per se, but it's how it's presented in the movie, whereas in this film, it doesn't really come off as subtext, it comes off more as text. And my issue with the film is not so much that the political message is on the nose, it's more so that... It's not as well written as I think it could have or should have been. Also, towards the end of the film, you have these corrupt cops who show up who are almost cartoonishly evil. At the same time, I understand why the film chose to go that route, especially considering the current political climate. Even though I don't think all cops are like that, I understand why the movie has the point of view that it does. Now, while I do think the movie is flawed, there is a lot to like about this movie. This is a beautifully made film. There is some gorgeous cinematography in this film. And also, this movie is clearly made by people People who not only respected the original Candyman, but also understood the original Candyman, I would argue even more so than the people who made the first two Candyman sequels that we got. So yeah, while I might have been disappointed when I first saw the film, after watching it again, I can honestly say that this is a good movie, and while it's not as good as the original Candyman, I do think this is easily the best of the sequels. Now, before I end this video, I want to cut to a discussion between me and my friend Jeremy on this movie. Now, this was recorded actually right after we recorded our reviews of Candyman 2 and 3. It's actually an outtake from our review of Candyman 3, where at the end I asked him what his thoughts on the new movie were, and I originally intended for him to give, like, his brief thoughts, but he ended up going off on the movie, so basically I decided to take that discussion and and edit it into the end of this video. Also, there are some spoilers in our discussion on the film. But real quick, what did you think of the new Candyman movie? I liked it. Um, I thought it was very well done, well made. There was some decent suspense in it. It was pretty creepy for a lot of it. You know, I liked how we kind of see the main character's progression or degression, you know, into the, well, oh, spoiler alert, the new Candyman. Uh, you know, which starts as, you know, the bee sting on his hand, and then it gets worse and worse. Uh, I didn't like, I mean, my biggest gripe with the movie, again, spoiler alert, 
is how Tony Todd only appears at the very end of the movie and only for 10 seconds. Hmm. That's it. That's all you get of him. I mean, I know... I knew right from the get-go that he wasn't going to be the main one in the movie, but I thought they'd at least give him a full scene cameo. I mean, this was just honestly pathetic. I mean, I guess I wasn't against the idea of there being multiple candy men. The problem with that, or at least one of the problems with that is, you know, when you call Candyman five times, what decides which Candyman you're going to get? You know, why was it always uh, Sherman in this movie for most of it up until the end, whereas in the other Candyman movies, or, well, in the first Candyman, it was always Daniel Robitaille. I think, again, going to my theory on the first film, and especially since this is acting as a direct sequel to the first film and ignoring the other two, that kind of adds to the idea that Candyman is a story that has come to life. So the idea that stories constantly change over time, are constantly reinterpreted over time, maybe that's the reason why it's a different Candyman this time, or multiple Candyman. That's the way I kind of justify it. I mean, that's a good point, but I still think it's a bit... I mean, most people, I don't think, go into it as much as we do. Yeah. You know, analyze it. Uh, so I think that still will confuse a lot of people, just because... I mean, on first glance, it is confusing. Also, I mean, Sherman... You know, he had the creepy look to him, but let's be honest, he's no Tony Todd. I mean, he doesn't even say anything, whereas Tony Todd has this great presence and has this great voice. It's like, why are you giving all him all the screen time? I mean, I understand they wanted multiple candy men, but why are you mostly only focusing on him? <laughs> it's like, you could have had Tony Todd appear briefly in certain other scenes. You could have at least had his voice, maybe say something to the main character when he was having hearing or having visions of candy. Give us something, some more of Tony Todd. Enough with Sherman already. It's still a good movie. Like I said, there were some effective scares, I think. Um, you know, and we did have a compelling main character who's trying to sort of discover his linked candy man. I thought it was, I honestly thought it was genius making the main character of this new one, Baby Anthony yeah. from the first movie. I thought... That was actually really clever on uh, the director and Jordan Peele's yeah. part. I really enjoyed watching his character delve into the legend of Candyman and also get sucked in deeper and deeper, which I just thought was brilliantly symbolized by a bee sting on his hand that gets progressively worse and worse as the movie goes on. Uh, I mean, the kill scenes mostly happen kind of through a mirror, sort of off-center. Uh, but I, I think the way they were shot was pretty decent, you know. It's like the mirror, the reflection of Candyman in the mirror has come to get these characters. So, you know, I know I just lay, launched into a sort of rant about my criticisms of it, but, you know, I didn't hate the movie. I, I want to make that perfectly clear. You know, I think they're trying to portray Candyman as sort of a, a metaphor for, like, black rage... And yeah, yeah, I can definitely see back at racism, uh, which I think was a good idea. Yeah, um, definitely. I like the idea of reflecting police brutality, which is a major issue going on right now. But I will say I do think it was a little on the nose in this movie, especially with how it was portrayed in the end. Like, if they... Those corrupt cops you see towards the end of the yeah. film... If those characters were shown throughout the film, I think I would have bought it more, but they just show up anyway and shoot Anthony as he's lying on the ground, you know, like, it just felt a little too, you know, slappity dappity do, if you know what well, I mean. That, I think that feeds into another criticism I have, that goes with another criticism I have, where the third act, I think, was very rushed, you know. Yes, yes, I agree with that. Spoiler alert, the character of Burke, you know making Anthony the sacrificial lamb to become the next Candyman. That, that kind of came completely out of left field, I think. Uh, although I do kind of like how they implied that, you know, because Burke was the kid at the beginning of the movie who unintentionally led the police to murder Sherman, he probably, the, the character, he probably felt a lot of guilt from that, and that probably fed into him, I guess, going nuts later. And what I'm saying is, him being crazy kind of happened all of a sudden, like out of left field, like I said. 
I thought if maybe if they kind of led into it more, built up to it, maybe that would have been more effective. The third act of the movie is where the film lost me. Yeah. You know, because I thought the first two acts were very well done, yeah, very so atmospheric. I, I still liked the movie. I can't stress that enough. You know, I, I still think it's a worthy sequel to Candyman, but yeah, it's not perfect. It has some flaws. I also really loved the use of shadow puppetry to tell some of the backstories of the different candy men. I certainly don't think that this movie was uh, beating us over the head with its agenda like uh, Black like Christmas the Black Christmas remake, yeah. Black Christmas 2019, I've, uh, I mean, I won't spend too much time talking about this, but I will say that I have been very passionate uh, about verbally bashing that movie on both my Facebook and Instagram pages, and I've really enjoyed doing it. What did the movie do to you? It pissed me off and was terrible and was a slap in the face to the original Black Christmas. That's what it fucking did to me. No, but Candyman 2021 is a good movie. You know, I, I don't want you to misconstrue what I'm saying as saying it's bad. It's not. I mean, there are some flaws, but, you know, it's well acted, it's well made. You know, I liked the main character. I like that actor a lot, honestly. I don't know if you saw HBO's Watchmen, the no, HBO series based on Watchmen. He's in uh, that, and he's also really good in that. I won't give away who he plays, but he plays a pretty important character. In yeah, I didn't see him in that, but I did see him in uh, The Trial of the Chicago 7. In which I still need to see that movie. In which he plays uh, the defendant Bobby Seale. Okay. Uh, and he's very good in that movie. He's a great actor. Overall, I think that it's a very well-made film, and I got a photo of the posters signed by Clive Barker and Tony Todd, so I definitely have an appreciation for it. So, I hope you enjoyed that. Now, the next video I'm going to be putting up is actually the video that I intended to go up on Halloween, but I wanted to get the reviews out of the way before I put this video up, so my next video is going to be a late Halloween video. After that, it's hard to say when my next review is going to go up. I'm currently rereading Stephen King's The Stand, specifically the original 1978 edition, which is significantly shorter than the 1990 expanded edition, which is the one that I originally read. But even so, it's still a long-as-hell book, so whenever I finish that, that's going to be my next review.